Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be here today. I'll take one second and tell you a little bit about my little nonprofit. Uh, it used to be up until two weeks ago called the Community Media Workshop. Um, we are unique in the world. Um, we do two things that a lot of other people do do, but we do one thing very different. We bring two worlds together. We were founded with the idea that a, a, a democracy functions best when all voices are heard, and that the voices of the community are crucial in the conversation about democracy. So we train nonprofits how to tell a better story, and then we reward journalists with things like the Studs Terkel Award. And as the years have gone by, and the tables have turned, and the picture that Ron told you about in journalism has changed, we've changed a little bit too. We can teach nonprofits now that you don't need journalists to tell your story. We can show you how to tell a story in a special way by yourself. But we also teach them now, you need journalists. The democracy needs journalists. And so our work has migrated to actually working with journalists to make sure they have that space to learn about issues and cover them better. So that's what today is about, learning about issues and covering them better. And I am really, really, really excited to welcome up to the stage my panelists. We have uh, um, Rebecca Paulpench Shimkitz. Please come up. She's the Associate Director of the Carter Center. We have Joe Pyle. He's the President of the Scattergood Foundation. And then we have Shannon Heffernan. She is a reporter and producer at WBEZ, Chicago Public Radio. Her work is amazing. And we also have Neil Steinberg, columnist, blogger, and a former colleague of mine at the Chicago Sun-Times. So I thought today maybe what we would do is we're going to dwell a little bit in the problem because I think it's important to set the problem up, but we're really going to move towards the solutions and the strategies and the things that we can do for success uh, I think we're in an interesting time right now in terms of mental health. What would you say, Rebecca? Would you say where are is we we know from Patrick um, and his speech today that we're we're talking about stigma still, but um, have things changed? Where are we? Well, first of all, I just want to thank Patrick and and his team for such an amazing forum, and the powerful book uh, that Patrick uh, wrote and. We, we share such a warm relationship with him and, and with Mrs. Carter. And as many of you know, Mrs. Carter has been working on mental health issues for 40 years. And when I listened to her and what it was like when she started in this area in the late 1960s, we've come a long way. We really, really have. I know we all battle stigma. We're trying to end discrimination, but we are making progress. You know, Mrs. Carter's role and, and the role that I have with, with her is um, helping to the media report mental health issues more accurately. Here's the deal. They want to get it right. They, they really do. So, but what we just need the, to help them do it. What are some of the problems you've seen? Obviously, you, you really have been working on those solutions. What are some of the things you see? What are the things you see right now today where you see we've got to deal with this? Okay. So we know we're making progress because in all of the polls and surveys that are coming out over the last couple of months, Americans believe you can get treatment and treatment works. Where we're having trouble is with attitudes and this is where the problem is. Every time we have one of these mass shootings and a violent event, we take se several steps back from where we were. And those events, we have to figure out a way how to report those events differently. I think we're good in, doing a good job on the positive side. There are more stories of recovery getting out there, but we've got to deal with the violence issue. And we deal, we sometimes categorize people um, um, who have mental illness, either they're the genius, um, mm -hmm. the crazy genius who survived, or they're the crazy shooter. Mm -hmm. um, and Neil, uh, um, I disagree. I mean, at the at the at the risk of being contrary, I think that Neil, uh, we would expect no thing well, less than contrary. I mean, yes, from society you. has gotten better, but the question is: Is the media leading that, or are we following it? Because we not only mm -hmm. we tend to reflect mm -hmm. what's going on, and so yes, we don't say, "Oh, they're crazy," or this or that. But in the sense of reporting on mental health issues, and I, I, you know, uh, uh, mass shootings are a very rare event. The question is, you know, do we talk about? Pe I, 
I've been at this sometimes for 28 years. I've never done this person has schizophrenia and they're dealing with it because you know they're in this cocoon of family. They're at a point you know where we don't get access. In other words. We, we are a kabuki in some sense. You know, we'll do, here's the 10 best scotches in Chicago. We're never gonna do, here's the 10 best places to go for rehab, okay? It's just not something we do. We, we like most, you know, when people say the media, I kind of wince because right. we're not this big Monolith. mass. We're a bunch of individuals. Yeah. And in a sense, we pursue, especially now that papers are so lean, there's no management at the sun time. I mean, I, mm-hmm. you, you can do whatever you want. Which, I mean, it, it's very liberating as a reporter, but also the, the, the sense that there's that, you know, the, maybe at the Tribune they have the Jedi Council who sits down and goes, now mental illness, are we covering that enough? But that's not, you know, in reality, it's a bunch of reporters kind of following threads and seeing things that interest them. So Shannon, um, let me ask you this. So your job, you quote people, right? You've got to quote people. And we had, uh, um, in April, our organization did something on race, police, and community and how to better to cover it. We had journalists coming in. And we focused on mental health for half a day. Um, and we had the issue coming up that reporters said, well, you know, the police say things to us like, he's schizo, or, you know, he's just totally mental, he's crazy. Um, and, um, and we got to quote him. It, it's, it's hard. I think that it, sometimes, and I've, I've faced that exact situation before, I think that there are often ways to write around that quote when you can, mm-hmm. and I think people do. Um, I think when you're doing that, you're doing an act of generosity not only to that police officer, but also to um, all the people who have to deal with that stigmatizing language. That said, I think there's also something, if you frame it right and talk about it right, that can be revealing um, if you reveal the stigmatizing use of language. I think it depends on the frame of what the story is, right? Like, it, 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 it's very contextual. It's hard to have a blanket rule for that kind of thing. You have at BEC, um, uh, it's not the specific beat, right? It's part of what you do. But you explain how you focus on this. You do a lot of work on it and how you, how you got to that place. Yeah, I, I do do a lot of mental health coverage. And frankly, I think it's the sort of thing, if, if you're doing your job right, it could and should be a part of every beat, right? Absolutely. If you're talking about education, there's a way to talk about mental health in that context. If you're talking about criminal justice, there's obviously a way to talk about mental health in that context. If you're talking about the state budget and you're a state house reporter in Illinois, man, is there a way to talk about that. So in some ways, I often get said, oh, you're on the mental health beat. You're on the mental health beat. And that's true. It's an area that I try to own. But I think no matter where you're coming at it from, there's a way to incorporate that into your coverage as a beat reporter. And is it hard? Do you have, uh, um, do you have support for, um, for doing mental health reporting in your? I'm very lucky. I have a, an editor who thinks it's an important thing that we should be talking about, and I'm in a newsroom that thinks that, particularly locally in Chicago and Illinois right now, it's a conversation we need to be having. So I don't think that's true for everybody. I think I've been lucky to be someone who's not had to, to fight and prove that this is something that we need to talk about. And Mr. Joe, you, um, uh, um, you actually support uh, journalists in, uh, in doing that work. Tell me, how, you, how did you, what were some of the things you saw that made it clear to you that this had to change? Well, when the foundation began supporting uh, reporting and journalism, we realized that the way mental health was being covered was not the way that we felt it should be. So we decided that we needed to create space for journalists that were interested in covering, as Shannon is, the mental health beat, uh, provide that opportunity for them. So we fund a full-time reporter on public radio in Philadelphia, WHYY, and we've built out an education program for local journalists, journalists as well as we provide mini grants for journalists that want to, to cover mental health stories. So we think that we need to improve the quality of the coverage. This morning, Bill Curtis mentioned that it needs to be on the front page of the paper. And I think I couldn't agree more with that, but it needs to be on the front page of the paper done well. And I think, you know, we have journalists here on the panel with us that are doing it well, but they're in the minority. And I think in order to get the message out, we have to create more journalists that are activists for getting it right, talking about it. And, you know, your, your comment about um, being gracious to that police officer, I think that, you know, we need to be thoughtful about how we report and cover because I think poor reporting can be worse than no reporting. Mm-hmm. 
it, it can be a balance. And I'll, I'll give you an example, a, a real life example from yesterday. Yesterday I took the train up to Chicago House. It's a, it's a, a residence home for nine transgendered individuals. And I, you know, transgender is much in the news. I'm looking for stories. I'm talking to the director. And so I'm thinking, okay, they place people in jobs. I like jobs because there's a boss who can comment dispassionately on this. And at one point, the director said, yeah, most people who are transgendered have issues with mental illness. And I thought, ooh, you know, that's kind of opposite to where I want to go. Now in, now, in turning a light on mental illness, that might be good, but I'm trying to get people to sympathize with a population that they already look askance at. And so I have to balance that in looking at the story, do I, do I go in that direction which might reinforce biases, people think they're mentally ill for being transgender, or do I go into a different direction? And not, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult balance to make. Sometimes. So if I were to turn to the Carter Center and your, um, um, your guides mm -hmm. for covering behavioral health, um, what, what would you say to something like that, to, to okay. Neil? Well, first of all, I brought the visual. <laughs> the Carter Center Resource Guide on Behavioral Health Reporting, we launched it just two months ago, and I think one of the keys, kind of picking up on where we were just a few minutes ago, is language is really important, and this guide helps with that. But as I'm listening to you, you have an element in your work that I think is so critical for behavioral health reporting, and that is time and support. Right. And a lot of journalists in this media landscape don't have that. And I know organizations like Scattergood and the Rosalind Carter Fellowships, we create those opportunities to have more time, to have financial resources, to have the technical and expert support to dig deeper into those stories, dig more deeply. How do we scale that and provide that for more Which is why your groups have to be involved because back in my newsroom there's a there's a boiler room with 30, 25 year olds and they they have to do five stories a day and they don't care about mental, they don't care about anything, mm -hmm. they care about clicks and they'll have kittens playing in yarn aggregated from sites in the Netherlands if that keeps their numbers up. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there and you know if I get a group, like I, I write for a website called Mosaic in London that the Wellcome Trust does, this $20 billion charity in Britain, and they, I did a story for them. I spent three months hanging out at UIC Hospital researching this, and that, you know, I did it because they paid me. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have these large, as newspapers go down and into mm -hmm. these, you know, as, as Ron referred to, you know, the people who do, someone has to do the work and someone has to get paid for that. A volunteer might do it once, but to day in and day out cover a story or to go look for stories that reflect a, a, a certain area, you need to have some sort of support somewhere. So, but, so I, I'd like to turn it around then. So we need some sort of support. We need readers. We need people who are um, uh, um, who will pick us up because they see themselves um, in the paper, because they'll turn on the radio, because they hear their story, they hear a solution. And here we're hearing numbers at the conference: one in four people, one in four people are affected by mental health. One in four people are affected by mental health. That means the other three quarters are probably touched by it as well, right? So if we turned it around to an economic issue. You want to survive as a news organization. And if you want to survive, you have to appear relevant to my life as a reader. So why is it we can't think of it that I'm going to way? I disagree again, Susan. I'll tell you why. Because look at, at stories on shark attacks versus stories on heart disease. Well, heart disease is what's affecting everybody. We're writing the stories on shark attacks. The idea, which is, might not be incorrect, is that you're not going to, oh, heart disease again, let's go to the shark attacks. You know, in other words, there, there's an audience out there, and they have these biases, and they have these ignorances, and we have to sort of do the balancing act of appealing to them while trying to lead them into the heart disease, mental illness side of the equation. Could we argue that maybe we're not covering them in the right way? We're not, I mean, a shark attack is a quick hit. A, a, a story on any issue, like mental health issues, that takes a lot of time, as you well said. Are we uh, covering well, I, them okay? Well, I would argue that, um, I mean, I would agree with Neil, but I would also say that part of why we keep looking to the shark attack is we don't have enough stories in the media around mental illness, mental health issues that are done well. Right. And I think that if we could increase that, that noise, that chatter around well done work, I think it might turn people away from the shark attack story and to the, to the mental health story. I mean, the number of stories, um, if you aggregated them nationally, and I think there's a group here in Chicago that's working to do that, would only be a small percentage of 
stories that are written on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think we have to increase the number of stories to equal the number of people that are suffering from mental health issues. And I have to say, the, the mental health stories we've done the last year have gotten really strong mm -hmm. numbers. traffic. And I think we often think of mental health as this like niche area of coverage. But when you do think about the breadth of population it, it covers, I mean, I think that there is a real argument um, to think about it that way. But I think it's, again, about thinking about it not only as mental health coverage. Mm -hmm. Mental health coverage exactly. is education coverage. Mental health coverage is health coverage, right? Yeah. Like, you gotta take it out of that box. I think we also have to take a long view here, too. Mm -hmm. And that is, we need to get the young journalists in journalism schools thinking about these issues. Because 20 years from now, they're going to be the editors. They're going to be the producers. And they're going to understand how important this issue is you know, to the public. More immediately, kind of bringing it to the current environment we're in, picking up on what one of the panels said this morning, we all have a job here. And that is, we vote. But more importantly, in the case of the media, writing letters to the editors, yes. having your voice heard, letting them know this is an issue that you care about, that your community cares about, that there are thousands of families in the community who are impacted by this, that is absolutely critical too. And the letters and notes are like clicks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you remember Nigel? Remember Nigel? Of course, Nigel Wade. Um, Steinberg! <laughs> we worked together at the Sun-Times, and I had proposed a series on the, um, how the media affect young women and girls. And they gave me a lot of resources for it. I had, it was to be a three, four-part series, and uh, um, broadsheet, you know, the difference between a tabloid that opens this way and then a broadsheet that's stuffed in there that opens the way the Tribune does. They gave me three full pages on a broadsheet for each part of the series, which is huge. After, on the eve of the uh, um, second part of the series going in, Nigel called me into his office, and I won't even attempt to do his accent, um, but he said basically, Susan, you told me people cared about this story. I said, yes, Nigel, they do. I have received no letters about this story. I have received <clears throat> no calls about this story. I have received no emails about this story. The series is canceled. I was allowed to put up the second part because it was already done. But that was it. I think we forget about that part. We're so quick to complain to the media about the wrongs they've done. I would say to you, everybody in this room, if um, in Shannon's next story, if you were to call in and say what a great story and what a wonderful, what a wonderful use of time, um, or Neil, if you were to do something like if, that, if, if you were to call half in. Half the public thinks mental illness is some sort of scam, okay, an excuse for bad behavior. I mean, I, you know, I, the reason I'm here is I, I am an alcoholic and I wrote in the paper uh, when I went through rehab. And someone wrote a, 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 a column in the Tribune when I had my memoir and he said, gee, you know, where's my addiction so I can have my memoir? And I actually had a good answer to him. I said, well, you know, don't be jealous of that. You know, Anne Frank had a lot of success too, but there's a price you pay. And, and I do believe that that's what we're, it's exactly what Nigel says, is that even though this affects people like heart disease, people, it, it's not, because it's so important to them, it's not necessarily what, and, and there is sort of a, a difficult truth behind it. You know, if I were to find someone who is bipolar, who wasn't as recovered as Patrick Kennedy is, or find someone who has a schizophrenic daughter who is institutionalized for her whole life, and write that story, you know, by the second page of that, you might be wanting to read something else too. So are you basically telling me that we can't change any attitudes? I think it's, I, I think it's a gradual, and I also think it's an acceptance thing. Like when I look at the transgender story, I am shocked. I never would have thought that population would have been at this point now. And so I, I do think attitudes change, but I think it's a matter of, it's not necessarily a matter of the stories we do, I think it's the tone we bring to them. I, you know, I, I just wanna thank Shannon for the thoughtfulness that she brings to the reporting, because I think that when you talk about that heart disease story, if you think about it in a comprehensive health way, you know, we now know that the data around heart disease and depression and recovery from that heart condition is significant. So I think if reporters were to write about 
the mental health aspect of a cardiac condition as they do about a statin and surgery, I think we begin to make it a more common issue amongst the people in the audience. Right. And I think that that's the other piece that reporting can do when it's comprehensive. When you take that preschooler and you look at adverse childhood experiences and the impact that that may be having on their learning, now all of a sudden people can understand that mental health does affect all of us, not just the one in four, but the four in four. Right. So I think that you know, reporting that is you know, embedded in all of our lives is really... But from a pri I mean, I've done a story on a heart transplant, and I've talked to the patient, and I'm with the, 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 you know, how they find the heart, and you're in the helicopter, and there's a narrative arc where you're following that heart, and you're going to Lowell, and you're watching it put in. If I said, Joe, you know, I'm going to meet you when you're committed to the psych ward in Cook County, and I'm going to talk about your recovery, that would be a very hard story to actually do, because right. the people who are in that crisis area, and if I went to... to, 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 to mental health professionals, and I said, give me one okay, of your patients. But I would, say, I would say very clearly, yes, nobody's ever saying it's not a hard story. What you do is hard, what you do is hard. There's some really great reporters that do hard work, but they do it. And I think that while you're saying newspapers are going down, we're having trouble with television, et cetera, I think there's other areas that are going up. I think we're seeing now the clicks and the quick hits aren't really what everybody wants all the time. They want a good, healthy diet. We're seeing more long-form stories and sites coming up. We're seeing more creativity, Center for Investigative Reporting, things along those lines, I, that, are, that are doing more films, that are doing more poems. I think we are, we're in a pendulum swing about where we're gonna go. And I think this issue has to fit into it because it affects so many people. And so how would you do it in a way that, 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 <clears throat> that takes into account the, the obstacles Neil is talking about? Well, let me, let me just say, because I think there's, again, I continue looking at the audience, but there's a role for you here. Um, I work with dozens of journalists on mental health stories and probably the most frequent request I get through my email and phone is, how can I find somebody who will tell their story, who will allow me to follow them through their process? Very, very difficult for them to find, and this speaks to the challenge. This is, again, kind of, there's a lot of positive to this, but negative as well, because so much of this lives online now, there's a rich opportunity to tell a story in, in a beautiful multimedia way, but at the same time, so many people shy away from volunteering to be followed because it lives out there forever. Right. But for those of you who are out there and willing to talk about it, make yourself available to these journalists. They really want to do these stories. So it lives out there forever and there's a stigma mm -hmm. attached to it is mm -hmm. what we're saying and mm -hmm. what we're trying to get over. That's that. the challenge. That's the challenge. But it can so, be told well. I'm gonna go back to you real quick, Neil. Um, it lives out there forever. Your story is out there forever, right? You know, people uh, uh, would ask me, they say, well, aren't you ashamed to, you know, admit to be an alcoholic? And, and, and I, I said, you know, I, I wasn't ashamed to be this notorious sponge reeling around Chicago, soaking up every drop of booze I get my hand on. Why would I, why would I be ashamed that I got better? And I do think, you know, I said, Patrick, that's what kind of a, what drew me to him originally, is that it does take people, but, but it's only a story that they tell in retrospect, although I wrote mine while it was going on. Um, I think that if, you know, it's, it's a way of presenting the problem. If we present mental, uh, mental health is a continuum, okay, and, and, and as, as, as a struggle that everyone has, you know, not just focus on people who are severely mentally ill, but people, you know, things that affect everyone, one out of four at some point in their lives. You know, I, I, was, I was trying to get, my, my father has Alzheimer's, and I was trying to get my mother to see a therapist out in Colorado. And I said, well, my, I see an alcohol guy every week. And it just, it didn't make her think, oh, I need to see a therapist now. And she was like running it back, you know, to me, are you okay? You know, it was like, it, there's such a sense of if you are getting any sort of help. You know, if I said, I broke my elbow, I see a physical therapist every week, no one's gonna go, ooh, what's the matter with you? Isn't your, I mean, they go, okay, your elbow hurt, you need, you know. But if I said that, you know, I'm an alcoholic, I like to talk to someone once a week, it helps keep me grounded, people, you know, you would think my mother would be a sympathetic audience, but she really wasn't. And so that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. So, so you, I have, I've watched you through your career tackle huge issues and turn them around. So how do we turn it around? I think it takes, I think this is gonna sound bad, I shouldn't say this, is, I think people forget. I think people forget about mental illness, I think it's a difficult issue, and people, if it's not, if, if someone's not shooting up the place, then we just push it aside. 
and we have to take it the way addiction has been a bit more now and drag it into the realm of the normal, yeah. where it's something that lots of people face all the time, that a continuing thing that you can be the most solid, stable person and see a therapist, you can take a mood, uh, you know, a, a, a medication for a condition, and that doesn't put you outside of the realm of humanity, and everyone does it, and you don't have to be ashamed of it. And that's, you know, that's something you have to bear in mind with everything else that journalists are trying to do. I think there was a great series, uh, New American, we were talking about New American Media, it's an organization of ethnic and community uh, media, smaller outlets out in California, and they did uh, a series across California about the face of mental illness, and they had, since they represent so many different communities, they went to 20-somethings, and they had them tell their story through video and through photos, and they basically said their struggles with mental illness. Um, and. And, and yet I'm functioning, I'm fine. And each of the papers agreed to run those stories. Um, and so the continuum was that this is normal and it is normal in all sorts of communities, not just one particular community. Um, and it, 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 it was an amazing, an amazing series that I think changed a lot of the younger people who were involved with it said, I never knew, I'm a Korean American and I thought this was problem was unique to us. Um, which was interesting. It, it is still very siloed and very hard. How do you tell the normal story? I mean, news doesn't, news is about the bad, right? Right. Well, I do think that's important, but I also, and I do think the personal stories are important. I mean, I'm in radio. We thrive on narrative. It's what we need for a story to work. But sometimes I, I think when you just purely have, when all the stories you have are these personal narratives of recovery or these personal arcs, you often miss out on opportunities to talk about things like policy, right? Which are more, to be frank, boring and hard to talk about in ways that are interesting. So my hope is that we find more places where those two things are brought together into the same realm. Because I, I feel like the separation of them out can be very dangerous. Not, 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 not a single story being separated out, but the fact that we do it all the time, right? That we don't have enough places where we bring them into the same space. I like the way you talk about mental health is edu education issue. Mental health is, I mean, uh, I think it was a statistic from your site, $190 million is lost every year in productivity or something like that. How, so how do you tease that into the teaching that you do for the reporters to the, that it is this story as well as mental health? Well, I want to be clear that we're not doing the teaching. We're bringing journalists together Right. Um, to work on that arc of a story. I think we also need people who are in the field to step up and trust journalists and bring them in. I mean, I write about right. Misericordia continuously, and because Sister Rosemary Connolly is there, and she's calling me, and she's dragging us in, and dispatching the baked goods, and doing all this stuff, and she is this advocate for her organization. So we are writing far many more stories about people who are developmentally disabled in Misericordia. In fact, I just reprinted a story on my blog from a, after one story ran, this woman wrote to me and she said, how come, you know, what about my son Louis? He's 21, he's gonna lose all services, how come you're not writing about him? I was in her kitchen the next week. Louis was on the front page the week after that with, with this whole story about how what a miserable job Illinois does giving services to adult people who are developmentally disabled. Unless she contacted me, you know, one thing about the media is people think that we smell the smoke from the burning building and we usually don't smell the smoke. Someone calls us and goes, hey, this is on fire, get over here. And so we need people to serve up someone to say, yeah, come to my kitchen, write about my son. And unless, once that happens, we fall on that, at least I do, like white on rice. But I, if someone said, go find someone who's 21 and about to lose all their services. And I, and I think to just punch that point, not only do people have to call you, but I believe we were both, maybe you were in the newsroom at the time, there was actually a fire in the Sun-Times newsroom, and everybody smelled and went, what do, you, do you think something's burning? <laughs> <laughs> Took us forever to call the fire department. Yeah. Um, um, so, and I think now, even more so, it takes journalists forever because there's the, you know, it used to be when I walked in, and this was, uh, um, this was only six years ago, the pile was this big on my desk. Mm -hmm. And the pile now is even harder. There's less colleagues, and there's less, we've lost a lot of the people who care about issues because issue reporting is some of the hardest reporting that you will do. How do you face that challenge when you, I know, I know you don't don't teach them, but when you bring those wonderful people in who do teach them, and you probably do teach them more than you know, um, um, how, do you, how do you face that challenge in choosing the journalists and asking, do you wait for them to come to you, or do you try to get them to be interested in this, that this is an important story? Well, you know, I've, I've been working with journalists for almost 13 years now, and I have been blown away 
by the numbers of journalists just coming to us. Um, it's like we've hit a nerve somehow. And I think it just speaks to that this is an issue we all have experience with in some way, including journalists, including the business community. And so there is interest out there. It's a matter of leveraging that interest and providing them with the resources that they need you know, to get the job done. I wanted to just add on to that conversation here because I think it's important for, for us to understand that different reporting provides different results. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the surprises for us in our almost two decades of the Rosalind Carter Fellowships is the changes in public policy resulting from the reporting of the fellows and the journalists. It's not just about telling those personal stories, the feel-good stories of recovery, but it's exposing corruption, exposing abuse, kind of the really difficult stuff to read, but the ultimate result of that is more funding for mental health services, destroying institutions that abuse, and providing life in the community, real life in the community for people living with mental health issues. Media play a role in changing those policies. So that's really important too, to, that you know, we think about this as not just one way of reporting, but there are a lot of different ways of attacking this issue. I know we only have 45 minutes and we, we have about five minutes left here, but um, uh, if you have a question or two, I would love to get that. Um, I, I'm loath to let them go because I just want to keep talking to them. And I do have a question. Here we go. Just a minute. If you, if you have a question since we're taping it, please go up to the mic. And I see we have a question through the app. How do we improve the media's coverage about, oh, that's, that's the name of the forum. <laughs> <laughs> see, we have a question and we're answering it. <laughs> um, uh, where is the mic? It's right back there. There's a mic there and then there's a mic over there. Mm -hmm. If you want to type in kfcnf.io, kf.cnf.io in the browser of your smartphone or tablet, you can ask a question on the app. Yeah, there's a major movie in your neighborhood now or coming soon called Spotlight. And the content of that movie is about the sex abuse in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But the second theme of the movie is about the Boston Globe and how they reported on that situation. And the way they did it is they had a team of people, four people, who worked that story uh, for months and months and months as a team. And they called it Spotlight. Right. And that, that group was in existence long before that, and I think still exists today. <clears throat> and my question for the media then is, is there a similar kind of group possibility for investigative reporting that you can do it not just as individual reporters chasing after the latest mass shooting, but if you, if you can get into a topic like mental illness with that much depth, the impact of that would be tremendous. And I, I wonder if, if your newspapers do that, or, or how does that work? We have teams. We have the, the watchdogs, et cetera, but we sort of, our policy is that we like politics, and we're trying to brand ourselves for corruption. Right. So we'll do endless stories about the Kochman case, which I never read because I didn't find it interesting. But uh, I did say, would they go into mental illness? I don't think so. I don't know that we would plunge into something like that because you know the, the, the downside of having a reduced staff is that we don't have a medical reporter anymore. I don't think we have a federal reporter anymore. Right. So in theory, they could do that, and they do that on certain things. But if I went and said, I mean, I, I, you would, I would see more an aspect of, of mental illness where I'd say, let's look at dementia in the elderly. Let's look at abuse. I mean, we won the Pulitzer Prize for photos of, of, of institutions downstate in the 70s. We understand things that are abuse, that are wrong. To say we're going to look at the situation um, I don't know the editor would make that, you know, Nigel wouldn't make that commitment. I'll let you go. There, there are some, though, you know, because we're, we are, uh, and there's a lot of people who will tell you that the media are dying. I think they're just evolving. Um, and so newspapers are not really always the, 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 the strength, they aren't the strength that they were. Uh, there's no equivocation on that. But there are places, there are places like ProPublica, which is an online investigative group. There's a, a, a place in California, ProPublica's in New York. California, there's a CIR, the Center for Investigative Reporting. There are smaller places um, that do projects, very big projects, and bring together freelancers, et cetera. And I believe there are places, your organization funds that, right? Funds yeah. journalists? So we, 
So I think that you know, one of the messages that I'd like to leave is I think that foundations, philanthropy, should work to support journalists. I think we need to give journalists the space that they deserve to cover the issues as they need to be covered, and then we should demand that they do it well. And I think part of that is we also need to offer them the opportunity for continuing education. Mm -hmm. I think that with the defunding of news desks that reporters can't get the the work, you know, the education, the training, the mentoring that they need. So I think I would ask everybody in the room that if you're connected to philanthropy, you should be working to support journalists. And I think another way to support them is the way Rebecca talked about in terms of, you know, give, you know making that comment, making um, it known that you appreciated that story. Because I think if editors eventually do feel the groundswell of, you know, we need to be covering more of where mental health is integrated into mainstream issues, uh, I think we'll see more of that coverage. I think if you ask Michael Farrow, the, the central uh, owner of the Sun-Times, he'd say he is a philanthropy who is supporting, you know, given the hundreds of millions of dollars he made on things that weren't newspapers. Um, I, I do think we've perhaps hit the hard bottom and bounce. We hired a reporter last week, which was a, wow. a unicorn event, and we all gathered around in wonder. And he wasn't 24 <laughs> years old, he had been to other places, and he can actually write. So I, I, I'm, there is hope. The latest center from the, the latest study from the Pew Center, which does a, um, uh, it's a gold standard for journalism research, um, shows good news. Shows good news of things going up. But I think there's a lesson from social media. You know, uh, we teach a lot of social media uh, to nonprofits and to journalists, and um, and and we always say, you know, it's not just about the message; it's about the conversation. It's about the back and forth. The uh, the um, algorithms on social media actually look for where the party's at. Where's the discussion? Where's the back and forth? And I think that element, and you apply it to the media, which is exactly what you said, is the back and forth. Newspapers and media are really a participatory sport. They hold up your democracy. So again, calling and talking is important. I think we're, we're coming to the close, but we might be able to have one more question. Thank you. I think one problem here might be false equivalency, that the, the, the goal of the media is always to give all sides equal time. Mm. But whenever we see a mass shooting, the frame that comes from guns ad gun advocacy organizations is that they're crazy. That, you know, just taking an antidepressant doesn't make you likely to be a, a serial murderer. Mm. Yet, the media tends to reinforce that frame by giving voice to those, mm. to those players. Rather than focusing, rather than saying, well, this is what these players always do. So, is there a better way to report in this era that, vi that, that goes against the traditional we have to give everybody equal time um, that, that can uh, speak to that because I think that makes you part of the problem because of your traditional values mm -hmm. of practicing journalism. Would you, anybody? Have Shannon, would you take that one? Sure, I mean, I think we as journalists have an obligation to look at all sides of it. I don't think we have an, uh, an obligation to give all sides equal weight, right? When you're a good journalist, you do your homework, and so you're able to call people out when they say something that's not true. Like a good journalist asks the follow-up question or fact checks the comment that's made, and you call that out. Um, I think that lots of journalists are working on tight deadlines and don't do that, but I think that is, that's, that's the goal, right? So if you hear folks saying things that aren't true, when we know the data and what we know about um, all the research that's been done on mental health, that the correlation between people who do these mass shootings and mental illness is not what it's made out to be. You gotta add that context to your story or just say, I'm not gonna do that story. The, the, the context isn't there, it's not, it doesn't actually add up the way. Did, that, did I answer your question? And the flip but side- it doesn't appear that way. We're not not to take the onus off the media, but there's also understanding that you have to do that during the, this sort of fraught moment after these events, you know, people are saying, why did this happen? And you find out, well, he, he was a schizophrenic and he heard voices telling him to kill, hmm, that might be relevant. Now, yes, that doesn't speak to everyone who hears voices or everyone who's schizophrenic, but this is not a moment where we're doing that. And the media does different things in different voices. And a lot of times, you'll be telling that story and someone will pop up and say, aha, you know, you, you pointed out that this person was Filipino. This is an indictment of Filipinos. And you're like, no. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a, it's a mutual thing that the media needs to only use things that are relevant, but people who have certain expertises need to have the sophistication to realize that sometimes things are brought into a story just to flesh the story out. So, I, I'm, gonna, I'm afraid I, I, I would love to keep going on this. I, I hope you would, too. I think it's an important topic. We have to round it up. But I would almost go back to what Neil said um, uh, the, earlier, 
when you said, um, you know, there's back and forth in this stuff. You call me and tell me there's a fire. Don't expect who I know that. If, you're, if you push people in the media, either through social media or through picking up the phone and notes, and you demand context, you demand better things of people, without maybe yelling or screaming, but saying, listen, you missed a story here. You've totally missed the story. Um, that helps. It helps them get the context. It helps them know somebody's out there listening. Somebody's actually watching and they care. And your voice back to the media has much more power than you would think. I want to thank our panelists. You were phenomenal. You. It was great to have you. And thank our audience as well.